All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk today about full text search in Couchbase 5. And some of you may have seen uh, this slide in the keynote this morning. And I'm excited to talk about full text search, but I really wanted to give you a warning based on something in this slide. I don't recommend putting your coffee as depicted in this laptop. Uh, from personal experience, that's a really bad decision. Uh, so I just want to clear that up. Yeah, yeah. So who am I? Well, my name is Marty Schock. I've been manager with Couchbase for over five years, actually coming up on six years now. And uh, see some familiar faces from a couple of the past presentations. That's always good to see. Uh, and for the last two and a half, three years, I've been working on full text search. Uh, and so one of the things that I'm most excited about is finally, uh, the full text search will go general availability in the 5.0 release. Uh, this is a big personal accomplishment, so I'm really excited to share that uh, with all of you. A little bit of an agenda. Uh, I'm not going to read through this. We'll sort of get to the, each of these topics in turn. So what many of you may be wondering is, why is Couchbase adding full text search capability? Well, we have adapters that connect Couchbase to a variety of other products. And two of the most popular we have are the Elasticsearch and Solar. And this is just statistics we've collected based on the downloads. Uh, and also talking to customers, like that's a very common feature, right? They've got some data. The Couchbase SDK didn't necessarily offer them the way to do what they want. So they wanted to have a second copy of the data in Elasticsearch to run their queries. But as you may know, that, that comes with some certain additional challenges, right? The one thing that's definitely not is easy. If once you're running one cluster, uh, you have a certain skill set to maintain that cluster. But that runs out at a certain point, right? When you have, want to add a second cluster, you're not going to run just a single node of Elasticsearch. That's another cluster you have to maintain. And in the case of Elasticsearch and Solar, that's going to be based on the JVM. So now you may need a different skill set in terms of tuning the JVM and so on. So we've taken this approach of adding full text search into Couchbase with the following things in mind. First, it has to be simple. One of the big benefits we've had in Couchbase and the success we've had all this time is that the products are very simple to get started and the clustering is not something that you're directly exposed with. So we wanted to make sure we address that. Second, it's got to be completely integrated, right? We don't want something where you need to run anything extra. If you're familiar with running a, a Couchbase node, you should be able to run full text search on that. And finally, we're going to approach this with this 80-20 feature set in mind. The idea being that we can't compete feature for feature with Elasticsearch and do everything it's going to do, certainly not at first. But from talking to customers, we find there's a common set of things that people were using. And so we've approached this from a notion of we can start out with this most common piece and add on to it as we go. So what is full text search? I mean, I'm sure the thing most of you think of right away is Google, right? That's the, this magic box. I, I go and I type in a bunch of terms, and I'm provided back with documents that are relevant to what I searched. And in Couchbase, it looks something a little bit like you see here. This is the updated UI in the Couchbase 5.0. And this is a search I ran, uh, in this case, for the term Sheraton uh, in, in, the, in the administration UI. And I want to call out a few other features that you just sort of expect with full text search. First is, the documents are returning these result text snippets in the results. And that, again, helps the user understand why a particular document was returned for their search query. And in addition to that, we've highlighted the actual term that they searched for, again, providing even more context to the user as to why is this document in my results set. So how does this work underneath the hood? I've broken it down into three sort of core pieces that are required for this technology to work. And we'll just go through each one. The first is this inverted index. Uh, the idea here is each of the terms in the document are what you see in that left-hand column. And then on the right-hand side, we've got the document IDs or postings list. All of the queries that, that you'll see later on when we do a demo are going to break down into either things that are you know, queries where we're first doing an operation on the, the terms list, or they are simply finding the right term and then returning the documents that you see on the right-hand side. So this is the core data structure. And it's also important to think of this as uh, a new access path for the future, right? So when you see all these nickel queries and all the advanced things we're, we're doing with nickel and all the indexes that are behind that, uh, the future is that we want to give nickel queries access to the same inverted index. That's going to be able to do things more than just full text, but also be an, like another path uh, for certain types of queries to be optimized. Now, another key ingredient 
in the full text solution is that it's language aware. What does that mean? Well, in this case, I've got a document that contains the word beauty. And you notice beauty is also capitalized. Now, that's what's going to do is that's going to go through this text analysis piece, which is a English specific stemmer in this case. And the English specific stemmer is going to create the term beauty, B A U T I. That may not be immediately obvious, that's not even a word. But what matters is when a user comes in and searches for beautiful, it's a, obviously a different word. It's the adjective form instead of the noun. In this case, it was also lowercase. The key thing is that when these things come into the same stemmer, they both produce the same term, beauty, with the I. And that's important because what that means is in the index, we're doing an exact match. And exact matches are things that if we get everything else lined up, those are things we can make fast. And the third key ingredient I mentioned is this notion of doing relevance scoring. One of the things that you find is different with search compared to a structured query like Nickel is that it's very common for searches to return large numbers of documents. And our customers are dealing with millions, sometimes tens or 20 million, of documents. And so it's not uncommon that you run a search query that's a very common term. You might have 80% of the result set, or, sorry, the result set is 80% of your whole documents. Well, that's not particularly useful. But it can be useful if you can then order them correctly. So in this case, it's, it's maybe daunting that I've got 1,000 results back. But if the most relevant one is the first in the list, that's really what matters. And the solution we're providing in the Couchbase FTS today, FTS today is what's called TF IDF scoring. And I'll just go in little detail about that. TF stands for term frequency. So the key is, the more often that the term you search for occurs in the document, the more relevant it is to your query. And then there's the IDF portion, right? This is the inverse document frequency. So the idea is, the particular term that you're searching for, if it happens to occur in all the documents, what that means is it's not a particularly discriminatory term, right? It doesn't differentiate one document from another because they all have it. So that serves to hurt the score. And of course, this is just an isolation, but if you have multiple search terms, all of these things factor in together to produce the score. And that's the key thing, right? That allows us to rank the, the documents and then return them in that order. So let's go a little bit level deeper into the design of the system and focus on some key parts. As I mentioned, there's this language-specific capability. And this we have built-in support for a handful of languages. I've listed. Uh, most of them here, the list is changing as we add, add languages as we go. Uh, but this is the current list uh, as I pulled it. Uh, and again, it's important to emphasize these are not sort of like final, fully baked things. These are things that evolve over time. Um, these <coughs> are, th and that really leads to the next point, which is the key thing here is you want this analysis pipeline to be customizable, right? So you're going to need to have the capability to tailor this, not just for a particular language, but also for your domain. So again, I listed a couple examples here. Maybe the documents you're indexing, it's a JSON document, but it has HTML inside. So you might want to, so for example, strip out the HTML tags. Uh, maybe you're building an uh, index, and your JSON documents are you know, auto parts. And so there's a whole different set of stop words you might need to use that are specific to the fact that it's an auto you know, inventory. Uh, and then there's more advanced techniques like n-grams, uh, which I won't go into today. But the, the point here is that you'll be able to customize this with additional components. And also, we want to be able to index non-text data as well. Uh, all of the things that you want to be able to do uh, in, nickel, in the Nickel query, you also sort of commonly want to combine those with your full text search. Uh, and so we have the ability to index numbers, dates, and geopoints. And I know some of you are probably thinking, well, but how, this is a little bit of overlap now. How, how do I decide whether I want to do this query in nickel versus full text? Uh, and today, that can be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, but again, the long-term vision here is that all of these, you can think of this as a new index, and this is going to be made available uh, to full text. So the question will then be, uh, which is the best index to build to run the query? Like, I know what my query is. I know the data I want to get back. The question is, what's the best index to choose to optimize for answering that query? And all that's something that we're looking towards in the future. Now, the other key aspect here is the ability to have flexible query. There's a lot of different kinds of queries you might want to run. Uh, we'll see examples of these, so the exact details aren't too important here. But 
The first you'll see is a query string. Uh, this is a sort of like the Google-like search box where there's a little bit of a syntax you can type in uh, to build queries of a certain type. But keep in mind, the query string is no functionality on its own. It's really just a language by which you can build these other queries. Uh, match and match phrase queries are the, the ones that are going to go through the analyzer, analyze your text, and do the matching uh, that you sort of commonly think of with full text. Wildcard and regular expression are ones where you'll be able to do actual pattern matching. Um, that's something that uh, certainly developers find that very convenient to use, uh, but it's used in other contexts as well. I mentioned the numeric and date range. Again, that's very useful for combining with other parts of your search query. And the exciting thing that I that I'm, will demo today as well is a new feature we've added for being able to index geo points and then doing uh, bounding box and distance queries from those points. Uh, that's not something you might think of right away as being a part of a full text search solution, uh, but it's actually something uh, that we're actually able to leverage the way that the inverted index works to make that pretty efficient. So I've talked a lot about the full text capability, but I know that it's important to this audience that uh, you have some assurance that this works like the rest of Couchbase, right? And what I mean by that is it's a distributed system, right? It needs to have replicas. It needs to support rebalance and failover. All of the things you expect from Couchbase, this has to do that as well. So I wanted to explain a little bit about how that works. Uh, your Couchbase data, as you already know, is divided up into partitions. They're called v-buckets. Um, there's usually 1,024 of them. And so in our FTS index, what we have is this additional concept called an index partition. And the way to think of it in the simplest way is it's really just a clump or a group of these V buckets together. In this case, A, B, and C grouped together into three, three little partitions. And we've got FTS nodes. And I should spend a little time and just say, well, what is an FTS node? In your Couchbase cluster, you're already used to the notion that uh, when you add a node to the cluster, you can choose which services it runs. If you use any one in the 4, 5, or 4.6, you know, you're used to seeing the nickel service and the indexing service. So what we've done is we've added an FTS service. Uh, so when I say FTS nodes here, that just means any node in the Couchbase cluster that happens to be running the FTS service. So we've got these FTS nodes and we've got these partitions. The next step is we need to be able to assign these to the various nodes. Again, you can control how many partitions you create, uh, and that's going to allow you to map, allow our system to map these for you automatically to those nodes. That lends itself, obviously, to support replicas as well, right? You want to have replica copies of your data so that, as we know will happen, one day the KR shark shows up and one of your nodes goes down. In this case, if the node Z is taken out of the cluster, you're OK, right? There's the replica of that data is on node X. And once that replica is able to be promoted, you're able to continue searching without losing any of your data. Now, Couchbase also has this nice property that we're using this feature called DCP, uh, which are basically streams of the data changes going from Couchbase to the FTS nodes. An important property of that is that, again, when that node goes down for whatever reason, when it comes back up, we don't have to start building that partition again from scratch. We can pick up from where we left off and resume. Now, that's how the, part, the, the index data is partitioned uh, at index time, but of course you have to piece it back together then at query time. So how does that work? Well, query gets sent to any node, any FTS node. Uh, if you're doing this manually with a REST query, you do have to know an FTS node to start on. But if you're using any of the SDKs, that's taken care of for you. Once that node is received by one of the FTS nodes, we then do a scatter gather approach. That's forwarded to the other nodes that have partitions that are needed to answer this query. And then the results are returned back, grouped together and sent back to your to the caller of the query. So in summary, this gives us all of those features that you sort of come to expect from a Couchbase service. So at this point, I'm going to switch over to a live demo. I think that's a lot more interesting uh, than in these slides, which can get a little tedious. So let's take a look at my cluster here. Oh, that's not going to cut it. Let me get out of this. Make that bigger. So I have, let's actually get the whole browser on screen. Okay, cool. So I've got the travel sample bucket loaded. That's the only preparation I've really done at this point. 
Uh, I find the travel sample is a useful data set for uh, exploring these kind of things. So let's click onto the search tab. And you notice I don't have any indexes created at this time. So we're going to go ahead and click Add Index. I'm going to call it Travel. And I'm going to choose the travel sample bucket. And I'm not going to configure anything else, because I want to focus first on just how easy it is to get started. Uh, I didn't configure anything. And the index is building. Uh, it's up to 2,000 some documents. It's not particularly great progress at the moment. But let's, let's check in on it. If we click over to Buckets and then click on Statistics, it gives us a bunch of charts. And there's a new tab that's been created because we created a full text index. And this gives us several stats that we can sort of use to monitor the progress of the indexing. See there's a count here, which is the number of items uh, that's just going up over time. That's eventually going to get up to about 32,000. Uh, items remaining, that's going to go down, sort of correlated to the other one. Uh, some of these are more interesting. The disk size is obviously something when you try and grow your cluster, you're going to be very mindful of that. Uh, that's something you need for planning purposes. Uh, we're using six partitions at the moment, uh, which again, you would need to tune that if you wanted to have more than six nodes uh, handling your FTS queries. So at this point, it has finished. And so let's go back to the search tab. And I'm going to just click on that. And oh, this, with this resolution is not particularly good, but I'm typing in the word water. So I just searched for water just as a common word that's probably in the data set. And we got results, but they're not particularly useful. They don't even look like the ones I showed you earlier in the screenshot. I just see the document IDs coming back. Uh, and so this is not particularly useful, but it's okay. What I wanted to highlight is we have two problems now that we need to work on. One, the indexing was really slow. No one here said anything, but you were probably wondering, like, this is not that big a data set and it took forever. Uh, and the search results don't give us any context as to why they're there. So let's, let's go ahead and fix that problem. I'm going to click back to search, and we're going to edit the index. And the first thing we're going to do is address the speed issue. Why was it so slow? Well, these documents actually contain a lot of fields, a lot of which are uninteresting for the searches we want to run. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to change that behavior, which is by default, it's going to find all those fields and index them. But I'm going to change that to only index the specified fields. So this, if we didn't change anything else, it wouldn't index anything, because we're not going to sort of control it. But by doing this, we can now add the fields that we want to work with. So I'm going to add uh, three fields, name. This is just your you know, hotel name, airport name, and so on. We'll leave that as all the defaults. I'm going to say store, and we'll see in a second why storing matters. I'm going to add another field, if I can navigate the UI, for description. I'm also going to store that. I'm going to leave it as the default for the analyzer. And we're going to add one more where we can change the analyzer. So this is a field called type. So the type is describing the types of data. It's very common that you would have a type field uh, in your JSON. So in this case, it's things like airport, landmark, hotel, uh, and so on. But what we're going to do different with, different with this type field is I'm going to change the analyzer to something called keyword. So the keyword analyzer has this property that doesn't do any transformation on the data. It's going to index that field exactly as is. And that's very useful for fields where we want to do exact matching. We don't want to find a field where it's like partially like hotel or landmark. Like we're looking for exact matches on that field. Yep. Um, what are the other attributes that you say? Sure. So I'll go through each of the checkboxes in order. The first is index. Uh, that's to decide whether you want to index the field or not. And you might think, well, this is an index. Why would I ever want to turn that off? Occasionally, it's, you'll have fields that you just want to store. Uh, and these would be things like, uh, just as an example, something like a, uh, an ID you don't want to search on, but that you need to correlate back to another document. Right? So it would be useful to retrieve it later, but not, you're not going to search on it. So some fields you choose to store, but not index. It, it's very used, it's storing is very much like the covering portion, right? So it's basically a way of storing a copy of, the, of a, any particular value at the time we indexed it. Um, so that's index and store. Again, for things that are, the examples we'll see here, it's useful to have it indexed and stored. Again, it's like the covering case, so we don't have to go back and retrieve it again to get the value. Uh, include in all has this notion of, if you notice, so when I searched water, I didn't tell you what field. 
And so what it did is it actually searched in a all field by default. The all field is a composite field, which uh, if we don't change anything, it's gonna, include, it's gonna include the contents of this field in the all field. So the idea is here, you could exclude things. So for example, you might say, well, I have a, I have a date field. I, sometimes I wanna explicitly look in that, but I don't wanna like by default search on those particular values. So if we were to uncheck that, that would have that behavior. In this case, we do wanna leave it. Uh, and the third, the, sorry, the fourth box is include term vectors. So term vectors record not just that a document used the term, but they record where inside of the field it used the term. That's useful, for example, if we want to do phrase searching. So to do phrase searching, I need to know that this term occurred in this position and it also occurred in a subsequent position. So if I am really concerned with space, I can turn off term vectors. If I say I don't need phrase searches and I just want to save space, I can sort of turn those things off. Uh, but again, by default, you would want to leave that on. So we're going to index the type field, and we're going to use the keyword analyzer for that field. And with just those changes, let's go ahead and create the index. And that's going to start rebuilding it. And it's, that's a worthwhile thing noting. When you're making these changes to the index, the index is going to be rebuilt from scratch, right? So you need to be mindful of uh, when you're going to make changes, because FTS indexes are things you're going to be changing over time. You're going to say, this search didn't work right. I need to go back and tweak the index a little bit to fix that. And when you do that, there's a rebuild time that you're going to need to take into consideration. There's a, some tricks to work around that. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so at the moment, you cannot change the number of partitions after it's been created either. So changing the partition number, if you want more partitions, you would need to re-index for that as well. Yeah. And is it okay to have a lot more partitions than the original? Uh, you can create, uh, yeah, I don't think there's a limit, um, but there are, well, more than 1,024 wouldn't work because of the fact that we're mapping vBuckets to partitions, so it would just be one-to-one -one at that point, even if you created more than that. Um, but there's a cost associated with every additional partition, right? So you're paying uh, additional search uh, time, so essentially group together the results. We've chosen six based on the benchmarking we've done. Uh, we had it as 32 in the previous release, so some of you that have used the 4, 5, and 4, 6 versions will see a performance improvement just from moving it from 32 to 6. Uh, so it's, it's based on, uh, so the, uh, it's deterministic based on the ID, so basically from the vBucket, from the ID we can determine the vBucket, from the vBucket we can determine the index partition. So it's not actually stored independent of that. Um, the client doesn't really need to know because it, at the mo with the current design it needs to go to all of the nodes that contain the, the query regardless. Yeah, so that's what we did here. When I said on that, uh, in, uh, in, like in index specified fields only, that's, that basically had the effect of excluding everything we didn't explicitly mention. And that's what I got sidetracked there. The indexing was a lot faster. I don't know if anybody noticed, but it was, it was a few seconds as opposed to a few minutes the first time around. Uh, and now let's go ahead and run that search again. I'm just gonna run the same search for water. The other big benefit we see is now we're getting that additional contextual information. Now we see the fields that we chose to store uh, are coming back, sorry, also, I don't see description, so maybe I didn't check the box. Uh, we'll look at that when we go back to it. But the idea is we're getting that contextual information coming back and the search term is highlighted as well. Now, there is one other new feature I wanted to show off today. This is a change, something new we've added since the last release, and that is the ability to work with geo points. Uh, so the travel sample has ge a geo field in it, Let's edit the index one more time. And let's add child field. So the name of the field is geo. That's a, like a structure or a map that contains a lat latitude and a longitude field inside of it. There's a couple different formats uh, that we support for that. Um, I'm not gonna go into them here, but GeoJSON and also a couple variations on that are supported. Uh, I'm gonna store this as well, though in geo it's not necessary in most cases. Um, searchable is geo. Oh, I need to change the type from text to geo point. And with that, we're going to hit OK and update the index. So that's going to rebuild. Uh, it's just doing a little bit of additional work this time to include uh, the geo point. 
And let's see, it's about halfway done. All right, now we're all done. Now, the Couchbase UI doesn't have any capability uh, to do a geo query in it. Uh, the query string doesn't, the, the query string is the only one that you can run from the, the administrative UI that doesn't have the ability to do geo queries. And there's no like map component hooked up to it. So I thought it'd be a better demo if I put together a little bit of a JavaScript application. Um, and unfortunately, at this resolution, it has completely taken off the navigation. This is why I'm not a web developer, as you can see. There we go. So I can make it slightly smaller so that I can click to the navigation. Uh, so the first capability I built is a hotel style, style search. And this doesn't have a map component. Uh, but it's useful because, well, you might think of a map component right away for search. It's actually not the only thing you might do with Geo. So the scenario we were thinking here is someone might search for, I don't know, uh, we had a previous Couchbase Connect in, in uh, San Francisco. It was at the Westin. Uh, so I search for Westin, and I get a list of properties. So this search, I did two things, right? I let the user type in whatever they wanted, but I'm additionally filtering that to only return documents of type hotel. And now when the user chooses one, I'm going to populate that with a list of points of interest that are near the hotel. So that first search didn't have any geo component at all, but then when the user selected an item out of the radio button, uh, I, re I ran another search, which is a geo search, finding things near that particular point. And that works because the document for Western St. Francis Hotel has a geographical point in there. We then sort of extract that essentially and use that as the starting point for our, our geo search here. Uh, and then we're also sorting it by the distance as well, right? So this, the other feature is you can sort the results based on proximity from a point as well. Um, so that, again, it's a little bit rough around the edges. It's something we put together relatively quickly, but this gives you some sense of a way you could use the geo capability. But the one you're probably most thinking about, I'm going to make this smaller again, is sort of a search by map capability. So this is one that's using our bounding box search capability. Uh, so the idea is we take the bounding box of the map, and whenever the map changes, the bounding box changes, we rerun the search. Um, in this case, I've centered it that, uh, if you can see my cursor, that right there is the Couchbase headquarters in Mountain View. Zoomed in on there's that. There's no points near that at the moment. Uh, but if we just zoom out a few levels, uh, we'll see our first point shows up. That's something really non-descriptive like LB1. Uh, but if we zoom out a little further, and I'll just drag to the coast, uh, we see there's some data points going back. Pacific, Victorian, bed and breakfast. Um, so again, not a lot of functionality built out. This is a quick prototype we threw together just to make it a little bit more visual. Uh, but again, gives you some idea of how you could use the geo capabilities uh, of the FTS index. So with that, uh, I should call it, the geo capabilities are going to be released as a developer preview inside of the 5.0 release. Uh, and that's mainly because they arrive really late in the development cycle. Uh, so we're still putting forward the engineering effort to get that uh, production quality. So I have just a few more slides to get through. So let's look at some best practices. Uh, these are not that exciting. They're kind of obvious, but they're very useful to follow. So the first is we always recommend using these explicit mappings when you're working with uh, data in production. Uh, it's just because that dynamic capability is really nice to sort of uh, get started right away without knowing how anything's working. Uh, but what happens is the developer adds a field with a bunch of text, and you can see what happens if you have a million documents and someone adds 4K of text in production, all of a sudden you're going to find your indexer is proce processor is uh, taking up all the CPU and that's going to blow up in your face. And you, know, you don't want to get this call from production that your FTS index, which had always been working nicely, has suddenly uh, started consuming all the CPU. But if you use explicit mappings, a new field showing up won't be a problem because it will always be ignored by default. So that's why in production, we always recommend using the explicit mappings. And the second is we always recommend using an index alias. I mentioned this earlier where you, you want to build an index and you want to make a change to it that we rebuild it from scratch. And that's very cumbersome. Uh, but the idea of the index alias is it sort of insulates your application from that rebuild process. So how does that work? Well, you're going to build an index called users v1. And your application is going to be coded to use an index called users. And the index alias, you can think of it like a symbolic link in your file system. It's basically just a pointer from this logical index called users to users v1. And the reason that works is when you need to make a change, you're going to actually create a copy of the first one and edit that 
And then while that's indexing, your application is still able to query the full users v1 without any side effects. But then eventually the users v2 finishes building, and you're going to switch in an atomic manner over to the v2 index. So your application didn't need any changes. It's now using a newer version of the index. And you were searching the complete data set the whole time. You didn't have to deal with partial results in the middle of the operation. So a little bit about the status and where we are in this. Uh, the first thing is, everything you've seen today is backed by a REST API. So everything is scriptable and automatable. Um, all of the search capability is supported by the SDKs. And I make that distinction because the administrative operations of defining a new index, changing the index, that's done only at the moment through the admin UI and through the REST API. The SDKs don't expose the ability to do uh, those, those capabilities. But all of the SDKs that are supported by Couchbase also have the FTS capability today. I wanted to highlight what's changed. Uh, some of you may have heard a similar talk in November. We've been hard at work. Uh, the indexing is up to six times faster. Uh, that's a huge uh, sort of data point based on feedback we got from users of the earlier versions. Uh, the performance is still not quite where we want it to go, and we, we have ideas about fixing that as well. Um, but I think users upgrading to the 5.0 will see a, a huge improvement. Uh, Wildcard and regular expression queries are up to 70 times faster. That's one of those embarrassing things where it was like a bug. It was like, might as well have been sleep 30 seconds in your query. Uh, but that's fixed. We took the sleep comments out. Uh, facets are faster. I didn't have time to give an example of facets, but if any of you saw uh, Dave Starling's uh, seen it talk earlier, uh, they make great use of facets. So facets allow you to uh, drill down in your search results. You do a search and you get a lot of results. You can kind of get hints about ways to navigate deeper into that. Those are three times faster as well. And really, if you're doing a high volume, uh, we've made improvements to the throughput across the board. Um, again, this was a lot of like lot contention issues and things like that that we've worked out uh, to really improve the throughput. The UI is a brand new UI. Uh, it's still a little difficult to use at times, but we've, we've been uh, making all those improvements. On the security side, uh, some of you may have heard of RBAC. It's the role-based access control. Uh, that's something that was added in uh, 4.5 and 4.6. Uh, but the main enhancement we've got here is there's now a role for the ability to query an index independent from the ability to manage the index. Uh, so you can get, uh, you know, sort of in each release, we're adding a little bit more granularity uh, to scope down who can do what. So you could have, uh, you know, a particular user and role um, scoped down to just be able to search particular indexes. Uh, again, I'm not going to read through all these. Bug fixes, uh, too many to list. Over 150 bugs have been resolved. Uh, and again, the key things we've added feature-wise are this, the geo capability uh, that we're pretty excited about. I'm going to go back to the same point I mentioned earlier. We're really excited that this is finally going to be in GA and able to be used in production by our customers. Uh, it's been a long time coming, but uh, it's exciting to see it in the hands of customers. If you haven't, uh, that Dave Starling talk I mentioned earlier, uh, watch the video if you didn't see it. Um, they give you a good sense of what's possible with this. Uh, I enjoy watching his talk every time. I've seen it twice now, uh, just seeing how people have used what we've built to do something I didn't even think was possible. Um, so it's a great video uh, to get ideas about how you could use uh, this. And with that, thank you for your time. Happy to answer questions with uh, whatever time's remaining. So what we do is right now we already have, I, I mentioned the customizable uh, pipeline. So what we, we, the way we'd recommend doing that today is we have two to what we call token filters. Uh, one is a length, which basically says if it's above this length, throw it away. Uh, and the other is a truncate, which says if it's above this length, just stop there and throw it away. Um, so either of those could be used depending on how you want to handle it um, to insulate yourself from you know, really large fields ending up in the index. Uh, at the moment, it's limited just to a point distance and a bounding box. Um, we will be adding a, uh, a, I don't even know the right terminology, but a shape-based search where you provide a list of points in either clockwise or counterclockwise order 
to do arbitrary shapes. That still doesn't get to all of the cases. OK, yeah, I'm not sure about the one with the hole in the middle. Yeah, maybe that one. There might be some additional logic for that. But that, that would, that's a good example of something where if, if you have a aspect of this that's not implemented or you're not sure, please uh, go to the forums and, and let us know. That helps us prioritize. Uh, I mentioned that 80-20 rule, so we have our own sort of process by which we're figuring out which features to add next, uh, but we'd love to filter that as well by uh, what we hear from you. Sure. Um, the question was, you know, what sort of like philosophical approach do we have in terms of how this is going to evolve in the future? Uh, so first, I'll preface it and say this is just my view. Uh, I don't can't make any promises as to how it's going to turn out. Uh, as I said in the very beginning, we're we focused on customers that are using a dual cluster situation. They've got a Couchbase and something else to do search. So our first goal was, could we help some of those users not need to run a second cluster? And we'll see, in the 5.0 release, that'll be possible. And we'll see some customers will make that move, some may not. Um, that's sort of the, the, the ground point. Uh, next, in terms of direction, everyone wants this to be integrated with Nickel, right? It's, it's, we, we talk a lot about like a unified API and everything, but this is not, right? This is a second way of querying. So I think the feature is really exciting, and it opens up a lot of possibilities. But the story isn't complete yet with respect to Nickel and this working together. Um, that's the next data point I would say uh, that's out there. Uh, if I look even further to the future, I would say there's more that can be done with a inverted index than just full text search. Full text search is the most obvious application. It's the one you would start with. But there are other kinds of queries in Nickel that could leverage this. Uh, and so that would be another area that's interesting. Uh, longer term than that, I would say, uh, the ability to bring all of these pieces together. Uh, if you've seen the other talk today about the analytics, uh, there's really interesting applications of combining the information you gather from your analytics with your search results, right? And so that could be used, for example, if I'm collecting data about how you're using my application, so that I'm writing data into another bucket maybe about how you're using the application. Now when you go to run a search, I could actually, and so the analytics is maybe digesting that and giving us other metrics on how you're using the application. That can then be fed back in at query time to deliver better search results uh, for, for your searches in the application. So I think this, the idea of combining this with the other features we're building uh, is, is more where I see the future of this going. Any other questions? I think we're just about wrapping it up. So one more. It's, it's designed, so we've, the, our philosophy has been to not deviate unnecessarily from the Lucene query language, but we don't support all of the things that the Lucene language supports. Um, so if we have a, if, if the features are a, you know, apples to apples, then we have the, the syntax for it is the same. Um, there's a couple things we don't yet support, so those are missing. But, uh, one more, that, this is the absolute last one. <laughs> Uh, it can be used, again, memory optimized. You know, some of this is marketing, right? So, I mean, it's, what it means is it's all in memory. Um, so, we support a similar mode of operation. I'm not sure if that's going to be supported in the first release, but it's, it's the, the capability is there. If you say, I don't want to persist it, I just want it in memory. Um, that's useful if you have your data, like, if your data is all in memory, why would you want to write your index to disk, right? So, uh, we do support that mode of operation from a functional perspective. Um, memory optimized, I don't know. You, you decide. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. If you have more questions, uh, grab me in the reception. I'll be happy to chat more. <laughs>